Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's January 2nd. And I'm Frank Curzio for the Wall Street Unplugged podcast where I break down headlines and... Tell you what's really moving these markets. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2019. It's going to be a great year. I feel it. Especially since the Eagles made the playoffs. You guys knew that was coming. <laughs> Just amazing. Put a different quarterback in there. and It's a totally different team and they sneak in. I don't know. I think Chicago may have been better off losing to Minnesota instead of playing. I would have rather played Minnesota again. And Kirk Cousins, <laughs> guys, I would have had like 50 yards pass in that game. Anyway, I won't get into football too much. Just very happy the Eagles made the playoffs, which is very surprising. When it comes to 2018, I'm kind of glad it's over. I mean, it wasn't the best of years. I mean, looking back, I, I think of how to describe 2018 from someone who's kind of, you know, follows media, you know, I was into pop culture and everything. And, you know, just a lot of contacts and things like that and families and friends and a network. It, it, it's like the year of being pissed off. Like, I don't think I've seen people more pissed off than they were in 2018. I mean, it started right off the bat in January. I remember in Hawaii <laughs> that happened when, when they sent those texts around. It was like a, a text from the emergency broadcast system when your TV beeps really loud and scares you or – if you get a text like about an Amber Alert where everybody gets it, and they sent a text that missiles were heading towards Hawaii. <laughs> you read about that story and Google it. I mean, you laugh about it now, but I mean, people were like, thought they were going to die. They were like going to cover. Imagine getting that. It's like the Amber Alert saying, yo, and it was, you know, just an accident. People were scared because, you know, all because one guy sent the alert by mistake. How do you have one guy control that? Imagine if you had control of that, what you could do, you cause chaos. It's insane. That pissed off a lot of people right off in January. I don't have to talk about politics. I mean, people hate when you talk about politics. I get it. But just, you know, whatever. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, but just some of the things that, I mean, people have become so pissed off when it comes to politics. You look at social media posts about Trump, Schumer, Clinton, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, 80 to 90% of those are angry posts. People pissed off yelling at them. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because- Pissed off people express themselves. When you're happy, you don't express yourselves. You don't tell everybody, wow, I love my wife and I'm happy. No, nobody goes around and says that. I mean, they say it on, on social media sometimes. My husband's the best. My wife's the best. Usually when you see that, that's an indication like within a year they're going to get divorced. The fact that you have to tell the whole world that you love your wife to everybody just, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, red, the ultimate red flag. But pissed off people express themselves. And that's, you know, Twitter and, and Facebook just going crazy on a political front. I mean, even Trump was pissed off. I mean, how many people left this cabinet or he fired? I mean, even going back, it, it, Matisse, Ayers, Sessions, Pruitt, Waddell, McMaster, Anton, Tillerson, Sorensen, Bannon, Spicer, Higby, Fitzgerald, Flynn, Schiller, Newman, Comey. I mean, these are just some of the names. When I saw the list, I didn't know. I, you know, you, you see it and you hear it all the time. This person's leaving, this person's leaving. But you actually have to pull up that list. It's amazing how many people. I love how pissed off you know Trump was and always sending you know pissed off tweets at all these people. Once they leave, hey, I love you. I want you to join. And as soon as they leave, he just you know buries them. What are networks like MSNBC, CNN, Fox News? Again, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. But I never saw so many pissed off anchors in my life. I mean, every day, every story, reporting on stuff that makes them angry. You never. Report on something. Wow, look what we did. This is a nice story. Look what we did for the party. What? No, it's all anger and, and yelling and blaming everybody. I mean, I actually saw one of the best political commercials uh, a few weeks ago. It's like an animation of Jeopardy with, you know, they didn't want to do exact uh, Alex Trebek. And then they have three people and they have a couple of things up there, like a 300, 500,000 amount, whatever. And the first person says, Alex, uh, you know, I'll take, Alex, I'll take 
you know, whatever for 300 or pol- whatever politics and they destroy the person. Well, who was the person that did not vote for funding during the hurricanes in Florida? And they put this girl up, the next person. And then they, tr- you know, and they just trashed the person. During- <laughs> it was it was actually pretty, pretty funny. But, man, it's you don't talk about the good things that you did. You talk about the bad things about your opponents. Right. I mean, it's kind of like tradition, but it's been to an extreme this year. The trade war with China. I mean, everyone's pissed off about this, right? I mean, really, China, the U.S. just can't figure something out because you look at companies, you're looking at at, at consumers. I mean, higher prices for us. It, it's difficult for for you know, companies are bold, bold countries. I mean, everybody is just like angry at each other. Lady of Trump's pissed off at Trump after finding out about Stormy Daniels. Can't believe she didn't know about that. Man, Stormy Daniels is, uh, you know. High profile, loves attention. I'm surprised you didn't tell everybody a lot sooner. The Democrats are still pissed at Russia for helping Trump win the elections. Again, both sides of the aisle. Not picking on anybody, but, you know, everyone's pissed off at Elon Musk. I mean, how many stories came out about Elon Musk and how, I mean, just the anger, the hate. You're looking at, at athletes and sports. I mean, they're more pissed off than ever, citing how much they hate the president, we're not coming to the White House, how much they hate their teams, their coaches. And hell, even the Steelers are pissed off at each other this year. I mean, start with Lavinia and Bell not being signed. If you play fantasy football, you know exactly what I'm talking about since he's basically the first or second, second pick of the whole draft and he was supposed to, you know, figure out a deal before the season, maybe the first week. He didn't play the whole year. Good luck. You wait the whole year to play fantasy football. You get Levin and Bell. Yes, I get the first, second pick of the draft. And you're dead. You lost. And Rossesburger is pissed at his coach. Antonio Brown. Yeah, that guy's kind of pissed off all the time. Doesn't matter about him. The Kavanaugh hearings. Holy cow. Did you see how that went? Again, both sides. Then to top things off, what happens? The market crashes at the end of the year. Completely crashes. The biggest names. I mean, Apple falls 30% from its highs. Industry leaders down 25, 30%. Falling, 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 falling. No matter what the valuations are, crazy. 500-point moves intraday during the holidays? It's supposed to be day. It's supposed to be no volume. Not five, 600-point moves, 1,000-point up. Crazy. The crypto markets crashed, destroying a lot of mom-and-pop investors. And then we had the icing on the cake. I mean, Times Square, the ball drops. Everyone's supposed to be supposed to be great, and it's pouring rain. I don't know if you saw that, but these poor people were not allowed to bring umbrellas. They're not allowed to bring umbrellas into <laughs> Times Square. So they have no umbrellas. They have no access to food, no bathrooms. And these people are there, some of them, 12 hours plus, to see some of those concerts on stage. And at what time does the rain stop? Like 12.05, it just stops raining. I mean, man, that's not a sign of a bad year. I don't know what is. But for me, on New Year's Eve, I love clicking back and forth through the networks, you know, watch all the concerts, entertainers. But this year was classic. I mean, watching hosts who really care about how they look. I'm not going to mention names, you know what I'm talking about. Just a total mess, miserable and CNN, CNN had it right this year. <laughs> Do you see CNN? You have Don Lemon, Anderson Cooper, Andy Cohen doing shots, and they're getting blasted. I mean, they were, they were shit-faced. And, and you know what? I'm not really a big fan of CNN, but it was awesome. It was one of the biggest trending things on Twitter and social media, and everyone was like, wow, this is awesome watching these guys. They're doing shots like you're supposed to do. Drinking and having fun and relaxing and just not talking about politics. You're just having fun and, and you, know, you, you get to identify w- with people, right? I mean, you get to sit back and enjoy life a little bit. So you don't have to be so serious about everything you report all the time because, you know, again, you, you're looking at, at the way 2018, even for me, you know, a lot of rants and pissed off. The media, they're reporting, which encourages people to take sides, not be unified, all this stuff. Just nice to see that and sit back and, and watch you know, a couple of guys just having fun, drinking. It's a party, entertain, have fun. It's cool. Big deal. It's raining. It's supposed to be more fun. Get messy. It's cool. You identify with people. We all wake up in the morning. Our breath smells in the morning. There's nothing we could do. We want to take showers. Some of us, we're people. We're all the same. It's funny. It's cool. But 2018, kind of a year to forget. I mean, no new innovations, so much anger, so much hate. 
And outside of the Eagles winning the Super Bowl, it's been uh, so-so. For me, I'm kind of glad it's over. And looking forward to 2019. I don't know if that was a rant. It wasn't really a rant, but a lot of truth to that. Just a little crazy, a lot of anxiety out there. I'm really looking forward to 2019. So today's podcast, I'm not going to be interviewing anyone. The first time in a long time, I think, for Wednesday, for the Wall Street Unplugged. I'm not doing that for two reasons. The first, it's January 2nd, and you know, I could have got a guest to come on, but it's the day after New Year's. I mean, the first day back for work for so many people, which happens to be in the middle of the week after a pretty cool vacation. Plus, the Sugar Bowl ended like 1230 last night. Texas beat Georgia, pretty good game. But I was thinking, you know, if someone like Andrew Horowitz, Meb Fabo have podcast, they said, hey, Frank, you want to be a guest today? You know, I would have said yes. They're friends. They're good guys. But I probably would have been a little pissed off that, you know, hey, it's the first day back. Let me relax. Everyone's like, you know, just getting back into the saddle, working on things, probably has a lot of emails to answer and stuff like that. So I said, uh, you know, let me just hold off and not have an interview or bother anybody. Back to the regular schedule next week. But the second reason is – because while most of you are enjoying the holidays, I was working a lot. A ton, actually, which is cool. I mean, I spent, of course, spent Christmas and New Year's with my family, but we're about to launch the biggest deal in the history of Cursey Research, which Cursey Research is only two years old, but this is actually the biggest deal in my life. For me, very excited, had the opportunity to do lots of different things and try to find that big idea and, you know, launching Cursey Research. And, and this is it. This is what I'm putting all my efforts into. I work really hard to put together for you, and that's our security token offering, our STO, that we're going to be launching in just a few weeks. We're going to be giving investors an opportunity to get a direct equity stake in Curzier Research, which means what? Which means as a subscriber, you're not just investing in my products, my newsletters, lifetime products, or whatever, but you're going to be investing alongside me. Right? A lot of people say that in the newsletter industry, but they don't buy their own ideas. So you're not investing alongside them. You can invest alongside a hedge fund manager by putting your money in their fund, but not really along a newsletter writer because 90% of this industry, they're not allowed to buy the stocks that they recommend. But this is a chance for you to invest alongside me as we grow Curzier Research into – and into what? And I want to grow this into a financial newsletter publisher that matters. I can say, well, I want it to be the biggest in the world and have all these aspirations and say, this. no. My goal is to change this industry, to make it better again. And I know it sounds corny. I'm not trying to be righteous or anything like that, but it's personal to me. And this is something that I grew up in when I was a kid, listening to my dad analyzing stocks at 10, 11 years old. I mean, my dad was a newsletter writer for 25 years, just go to CNBC, Bloomberg with him. You know, I, I was in the same studio with Warren Buffett when he was there. And Warren Buffett has a signed letter to him. My dad sent him his book. I mean, you know, I, I grew up through the Navaliers and the Gabellis and watched these guys become, you know, have these huge companies at Icon back then. You know, being here at this stage and, and watching what's going on in this industry and what it turned to, it, it's, it's crazy. It really is. Because right now, there's so many publishers out there that are taking advantage of you. And by you, I mean millions, millions of mom and pop investors. You want a good example? My father-in-law called me last week. Doesn't invest much, invests a little bit of money. He's a good guy. He said, look, I don't want to bother you. I know you're busy. I was just wondering if you could take a look at a couple of these stocks that I bought, and they happen to be marijuana stocks. And all of them are down 70% plus since he bought them, right? These tiny little stocks. And why did he buy them? Because he went on the internet and whatever it was, and there's cookies that were tracking him because he probably clicked something. And he keeps seeing this hype promotion in front of him that he's going to generate 10,000, 5,000% months, whatever it is. So he says, all right, let me pay whatever, 39 bucks for, for the news. And you're like, it's only $39, even though you're going to invest a lot of money and chance, you know, you're going to lose it. People don't calculate that, right? And they're pitching marijuana. Why? Because it's very popular, becoming legal in more and more states. I know the trend because I was close to being first to talk about it within the financial newsletter industry back in 2014. We had a great promotion, great stocks in it, but we were early. Nobody cared. The promotion did crap. It did nothing. Nobody was interested in it. And that's normal. That's normal. Because the things that people aren't interested in, like the, the ideas that I'm bringing to CVO subscribers, like Curse of Adventure Opportunity subscribers, where 
you know, you're getting ideas. It's a you know swing for the fences, and, and some of the stocks don't work out. But the ones that do, usually you'll hear about months later or years later, and other news that are. Riders are recommending them when you're up, you know, hundreds of percent. We've had so many stocks like that where we're getting into them early. When nobody cared. But unfortunately, we're all programmed. We're all programmed to buy things when they're exciting, when people are talking about it, right? And everyone's talking about marijuana in 2018. Massive campaigns will launch at the top of the market. I mean, you had midterm elections, right? Where marijuana is, is a hot topic. So it's being mentioned in the media and, you know, they're marketers. They know this. They know you're going to see this everywhere, and you're going to be like, wow, I need to get into it. Wow, because the more you see things, the more you know it gets programmed in your brain. And he bought these, a, lot of these, a lot of these stocks, and he got crushed. I mean, that, that's marketing 101. I mean, sell what's hot. It makes sense. I mean, nobody wants to buy uranium right now, right? Everyone's like, ah, yeah, uranium. Nobody likes it. I mean, there's a few stocks you could buy in the industry. Not so exciting, but five years from now, you'll be happy, and when you know, prices are seventy, eighty dollars per pound, and go up three to three hundred percent from where they are now. Then you're gonna see tons of promotions. You're gonna see tons of companies changing their names and stuff like that. And that's where, you know, the mom and pop investors are the last to know. You know why? Because everybody wants to let you know. This way, you buy a ton of it while all the insiders who made a fortune already sell it to you. That's the game plan. Crazy when you think about it. So same thing in crypto, right? How many big promotions went out February, March? And with us, we launched our crypto intelligence newsletter in June, July, which, again, the market has fallen. We stopped recommending stocks, and they're really focusing on the STO market and telling everyone, being up front, listen, we've analyzed over 500 of these things, probably up to 700 now. I thought it was 80%. It's more like 90% of those security uh, of the utility tokens are going to be worthless. They're crashing because of the security token markets coming up. Again, a lot of promotions get launched at, at the top, right? Right at the top of these trends, which is crazy. And look, you look at publishers, you look at any company, you look at healthcare companies. I mean, healthcare companies, they don't want to they don't want to give you a cure, right? Because the cure, that's it. They want to give you a treatment that you have to pay for forever. This way they generate profits. That's the nature of all businesses. They don't want to make profits. I get that. But in our industry, it came to the point where some publishers are hiring big name people, political figures to help sell their products. These popular figures usually have huge loyal followings and they get behind it and, and people recognize them. Which often results in so many more people buying these things. But you know, these popular figures, they don't know shit about finance. They don't have to analyze an income statement or balance sheet. It's just a show. It's all about sales. And what happens? Well, the publisher makes a ton of money selling the idea through the newsletter. The popular figurehead gets paid probably at least six figures up front, so he makes out well regardless of what happens. The editor of the newsletter also does great since that person's going to receive a percentage of sales from the promo. Just interesting. And you, the customer, which this business is supposed to be about, mom and pop investor, who turns to the financial newsletter industry because they don't trust Wall Street, gets, I won't use the F word, but you know where I'm going. And they lose a fortune on these investments. And the best part, the editors are not allowed to purchase the stocks they recommend based on these companies' policies. So while they're going to tell you the stocks are going to go 5,000% in six months, they're not buying it, which is crazy when you think about it. I don't know about you, but if I had an idea where I could make 10,000% in six months, why would I give it to everybody else? I mean, I would invest – if my company's policy I'm working for says I can't invest in it, I would put it in my portfolio and take a big position in it if I really thought that. So everybody's making money except for the actual person, the customer. Think about that. How many businesses do you know that succeed that treats their customers like shit? I've analyzed over 10,000 companies easily over my career. It's rare. Unless you have some form of monopoly like a Comcast cable company, uh, uh, you know, Verizon, AT&T, where you don't have many choices, uh, you know, for internet and wireless, whatever. But most companies, I mean, you treat your customers like garbage and they're getting crushed while you're making a fortune and have record profits. There's something wrong with that. There really is. Again, I'm not looking to tell you this it's to be righteous. Uh, yeah, you know, normally I wouldn't care about it. It's almost like the hedge fund industry where they charge, you know, massive fees when they make you money, right? But if they do poorly and get crushed for five years, 
yeah, they're not going to return those fees back to you. And you can invest a million dollars with them. They generate whatever, 30%, 40% returns. They're going to take massive fees off of that. So your account sits at whatever, you know, 1.2, 1.3 million, whatever. And everyone's happy, right? Because everyone's making money. But then what happens next? And see, if you have a fund like Einhorn that crashes, that just completely crashes over, the, over a six-year period. Now you have $700,000 in your account, but they, they don't care. They made a killing off of that. They made a killing in fees off of you. Right, you already paid them fees. Now, now your account's worth half as much. Again, I'm not, you know, something I don't care about much since I'm not in the hedge fund industry nor my family members. But the financial industry, it, it, it's personal. I mean, having my dad as a prominent newsletter writer for over 25 years, I've been writing financial newsletters for over 25 years, and to see where the industry is today, where there's such little focus on the customer and educate them. And mom and pop investors, it, it's sad. Again, when all these companies are generating you know, record profits, massive profits, and the people at the top are getting filthy rich at these companies, and then you see the customers and you getting destroyed, I mean, it's tragic. It really is. So for me, that's why I'm making the bold move, to raise money through something unique, which is a security token offering, to grow Curzier Research, into a credible, into a bigger, well-known financial newsletter publisher, one that people could trust. Not saying our returns are going to be great all the time. Yes, we got smoked just like everybody else during the market crash over the last three months, and we stopped out of a lot of positions. But our focus is about you. That's got to be the goal. I mean, it just makes sense from any point of view. Every, I, there's a ton of people that listen to me. Okay, this broadcast probably get. Over 200,000 downloads every month through the podcast, right? So, and a lot of you have your own businesses. Imagine if you didn't focus on the customer. Right? You just made a fortune and, and, and your customer got smoked or you sold them you know, something bad that you know, wasn't good. Hey, what's going to happen? You're seeing it already. I mean, just from these promotions, a lot of our big competitors are starting to get kicked off Google, Facebook, the credit card processors. I mean, it's, it's so difficult to, to start a newsletter. Not to start one. Anyone could start a newsletter. But – to have like a, a multi-million dollar business in this or, or generate two, three million in sales, credit card processes are all over you. They treat this industry like it, it's, it's, it's the porno industry. I, I mean, when it comes to credit card processing, they, you know, they, they don't process, they hold money. I still have First Data. First Data is the biggest piece of crap in the world. First Data is holding $500,000 of my money for over a year. Money that we generated off subscriptions. They're holding it, thinking that people are going to Ask for their money back and their worry, even though we said we'll cover it and our subscriber, we've been in this business for a long time. The fact that we're only in two years, they're still holding that money, generating interest off of it. And it's funny because it was over a million dollars and they started releasing something. Over a year, they're still giving us problems. They're holding our money that we generated. Think about that. How many businesses could survive to, and do that? Not a lot. And we ran into, yeah, it was tight having, you know, thinking you have that much money in the bank and they're like, well, but we're going to hold it. You know, you have lifetime members and, you know, they can ask for that money back whenever. And, and we're like, well, you know, we have a loyal following. We're good. And, you know, these are lifetime offers with no refund. Didn't matter. They didn't, even, didn't care. But think how crazy that is. Why is it like that? Because is it, there's so many people asking for their money back because there's so much hype out there and BS when they sign up to these crazy promotions. They don't get what they, they signed up for. So when it comes to the security token, it's exciting. I mean, it's a bold move. We could obviously do something where it's a traditional private placement, but the security token is better for us in terms of fees, where you don't have to pay out a lot of people, in terms of investment banks and stuff like that. But also, it's great for investors. And if I did a traditional private placement, you know what your liquidity period is or when you could actually you know, cash out? On average, it's seven to 10 years. Your liquidity period only happens with a private company if I get acquired or if I you know, do go IPO route and come public. With this, the token is going to be trading 12 months from now. And I know what you're thinking because you say, wow, the whole crypto market's crashing. Those are utility tokens. I've been saying this for over three months, even in our crypto intelligence newsletter. We thought that the top 20 would do good, and we have recommendations. Even those have gotten crushed, which surprised us. But we only have about 20% exposure to those companies. That's all. Everyone, should, if you had whatever you had and you put into our newsletter, you should be have around eighty percent in cash. I know that might have frustrated a couple of people because they're like, "Well, I subscribe to this. I want the new ideas." Listen, I see the market. I'm going to call out it is. I, 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 that's how I built my credibility. I'm not going to just 
send you things that I know are going to get destroyed because the more we dug into this industry, I, these things are worthless. That's why it's crashing. And it's going to continue to crash until 85, 90% of these tokens are gone because utility tokens are not tied to anything. You have zero equity in these things. Their only obligation, think about this, guys, their only obligation when they raise money through that utility token was to give you a token. That's it. All they had to promise is they give you a token. They didn't have to tell you what they did with the money. They didn't tell you that they kept the money in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, which is down 70 80%. They didn't tell you that they bought houses, flying first class, whatever, new cars. They didn't have to tell you anything. And even if a company comes and takes these, these guys over and says, wow, that's a good idea, and we're going to pay $20 billion for it, you get nothing, nothing. There's no equity. The utility token only gives you a right to use their products and services. It's kind of like Dave and Buster's or Chuck E. Cheese if you brought your kids there. You have a token you could use in Chuck E. Cheese. Once you leave, that token's worthless. It's the same thing. So when you think in crypto, when you say, wow, well, I'm nervous. No, the reason why this is crashing is, is, is giving way to this incredible industry, which is security tokens and a tokenization of assets. And over the past few months, the amount of activity that's taken place in this industry is amazing. I've been neck deep in this, learning everything, trying to bring these two industries together, Wall Street and, and the crypto markets, which is so difficult because you have experts on both sides, but no one's an expert for everything, which I've... Kind of my job is to be the go-between to say, how do we merge these two markets? Because this is an idea that just makes sense. It just makes sense. I mean, it's almost like Uber. I mean, Uber just makes sense. And I have nothing against taxi drivers. But Uber is cheaper. It's safer where you can call a driver to – you know, tell him what you're wearing so he can pick you up and you can look at his star rating, and, you know, so you know exactly, you know, he's been vetted, you know exactly who it is. You don't have to wait in a cab until the payment gets processed, which, you know, growing up in New York City or every major city, what happens? You know, you're waiting for the, pro he pulls over the curb, you're waiting, you have the door, and it's a guy like right on the door, waiting, waiting, waiting. You're waiting for the credit card to process or you're waiting for your, it's just a whole hassle where you get in, you get out. It just makes sense on every level, Uber. Whether you hate it, it just makes sense. That's the security token market. It just makes sense for companies, for small companies, you know, looking to raise money, looking to grow their company. It's much cheaper and quicker to bring your token to market than going through the traditional IPO route. You don't have to pay these huge fees to investment bankers. Which investment bankers, what are they? They're middlemen, right? That's all they are. They're a bookie that collects a VIG. They bring people together. They don't produce anything. It, we're, we live in a fee environment where everybody charges fees for everything. I, mean, I can't tell you how much shit I got for charging a maintenance fee that we disclosed up front for every one of our lifetime offers and said, listen, we have to, in order for you to give a lifetime offer, we have to charge a maintenance fee because, you know, the, we plan on offering this to you for five, 10 years. If we do, it costs money to design, to send out some emails that over a 10 year period. And it's a very small fee. It's actually a real, you know, fee that we need to charge in order to, to make this offer happen. Everybody bold, we put it, it wasn't a big fee. Very, very small. But it's just the perception out there, and you're right, just the fees are, are – everything fees you to death out there. It's crazy. It's nuts. I went to Vegas. I'm going to Vegas to an electronics show next week. And you know you book your hotels now, and that doesn't include the $50 extra charge per, per night per room now. Everything is a fee, everything. It's insane. But you look at investment bankers, I mean, you eliminate these people who are collecting fees for not producing anything. They just bring it. And listen, I have friends in the investment banking industry, and they're great guys. Some of them are brilliant. But it's not a necessity once this industry gets going. And that's why I think it's going to be a trillion-dollar industry. It just makes sense. It's not going to replace the NASDAQ. It's not going to replace New York Stock Exchange. So the cost of mango from Securitize, who we're partnered with, one of the largest in the industry, creating our platform. You talk, this is something that will replace companies on the pink sheets. It'll be more safer, more transparent. And you have the major institutions out there talking to the SEC and saying, when are you going to regulate this industry? We're saying the same thing. We want this regulated because people need to know that their money is safe when they invest in things like this. And that's why we're using Securitize, which your money is secure with them. That's why we hired – some of the best lawyers in crypto who are fantastic. We went to visit them Wall Street and Trump Tower building and, and you know, familiar with these offerings and preparing us so we'll be fully compliant when the SC does regulate this, doing everything by the book. 
But those big institutions are all over this because this threatens the foundation that their businesses were built on hundreds, over 100 years ago. And they're prepared. They're prepared. They're meeting with Congress that believe me, the inside stuff that's going on, and a lot of this is reported, and I'm telling you anything, and, you know. But they're with Goldman Sachs, Fidel, you name it, venture capitalists, uh, uh, hedge funds, you, you name it. They're all looking to get into this industry. They know how big it's going to be. I mean, here, you want proof. Here's a, here's a list of what's taking place, which a lot of people don't know because it's, you know, everyone's focused on the markets and things like that and coming down. And But the amount of activity taking place in this space is absolutely amazing. For example, you look at it, June 2018, right? So June, Coinbase acquired several SEC-regulated entities, which is going to help it basically become a security token trading platform now. So they're going to trade security tokens. Remember, they just trade, what is it, the top five cryptos? So yeah, you're looking at one of the biggest, one of the safest in the world, which is great. You're looking at, and guys, this is just taking place recently. So you look at September. These are all from September. Andy Warhol tokenized one of his biggest paintings, took a 31.5% stake, which was $1.7 million. So you're seeing these things happen right now. I mean, Templin Markets issued nearly $100 million worth of Aspen coins, where each token, it's a security token, represents a common share in the St. Regis Aspen Resort. You're looking at, again, also September, movie coin smart funds. So this is created by one of the biggest producers in Hollywood, Chris, Christopher Woodrow. Uh, so investors are going to be able to finance movies now using security tokens, a market that was never available to them. Uh, you're looking at NASDAQ Fidelity. Uh, there's over 50 participants, including these guys, venture capitalists. They're meeting with members of Congress to help regulate digital assets. So, that, again, they want to get in this industry. Uh, open Finance in October received capital from Sharp Ventures to invest in its security token platform, which you know, they're launching. Over a dozen of these exchanges are expected to be launching, just trading security tokens in the U.S., fully regulated. And – Easy to use, not like Binance and everything is in, you know, 0 0.00, whatever. There's no conversion tables. It's very difficult to use these platforms right now. Now we have to make it so it's more like E-Trade, more like Scott Trade, more like whatever platform you use, Schwab, Fidelity. Uh, you know, this way people feel safe about their investments. I mean, that's huge right now. So you look at T0, raise over $130 million, their preferred security token offering. Uh, they're going to launch their platform in just a few months. They said first quarter this year, they're going to start trading security tokens. Uh, you look at Securitize, which is one of our partners, right? It helps with our platform. They just received nearly $13 million from Coinbase Ventures, Blockchain Capital, Ripple. Again, mentioned this earlier. Uh, you know, so you're seeing so many transactions in take place. I mean, Prolithium is another company raised $12 million to build an SEC-compliant security token exchange platform. Uh, MedTech, a, just a Swiss uh, venture capitalist firm, launched an STO platform just for medical devices, life sciences, digital health, right? So you're hearing about tokenizing uh, real estate, which is a $200 trillion market, or, or you know, art or, or collectibles, right? Things that aren't liquid, now you could tokenize and sell off a portion of it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing people where he wants to be able to have people tokenize their homes, I mean, how crazy would that be? I'm curious to know about it. I don't want to give it. I don't know the details, but I, I was just like, wow, this, this seems like a good idea. I don't know how you're going to do it. It's almost like everyone individually. But again, if you have an asset, you could sell off a portion of it and tokenize it. And that's what people do, especially with real estate, commercial real estate, a Babe Ruth rookie card that could be worth millions of dollars. You could tokenize it. So now you own that asset when it appreciates. If it's sold to somebody else, you're going to get paid. It's not like the tokens that are on the market right now. So that's why the current crypto market is crashing, and you're seeing this the way it should have been in the first place, where you know, you're getting an actual equity stake where it's for the investors. It's not just, hey, let me take money right now. It's a money grab. Everybody wants to get into this industry, and these tokens are just going up because they would go up no matter what it was. You can put whatever you want, dirt in a jar, and if people like it, they're going to bid higher for it, and when they don't want it, it's going to go lower. End of the day, it's it's going to be worthless. It's not tied to any assets. But the amount of work taking place in this industry is incredible. And we created a site recently called Token Tracker. And we're taking all the news stories, kind of like what we do in our weekly breakdown, and posting of how much activity is going on behind the scenes and how the big names are getting involved in this industry. They're preparing to get involved, how all these exchanges are going to be launched. We're dealing with lawyers that are also saying that 
There's other security tokens, that, plenty of them that, that are launching and, you know, they help us out tremendously. But it is amazing to see what's taking place in this industry, which kind of gets lost with the market coming down and overall crypto getting coming down. And people who don't understand the crypto industry might be like, wow, why are you doing this when crypto is coming? It has nothing to do with crypto. Okay, it has nothing. It has nothing to do. I shouldn't say nothing to do with crypto. It's going to be a blockchain, our token, but it's not the current tokens that you're seeing crash. This is going to be tied to our business, the health of our business, how we're doing, how we're growing, similar to a stock. If you own IBM and IBM does great, it's going to go high. If the whole market comes down, yeah, you know, you're going to see it fluctuate. But as long as IBM is doing well, you, it's, it's going to be reflected in that price. There's going to be value there. So that's what we're doing with this process. And for me, look, I've been neck deep in it for over six months. And I can tell you, few know what I know about the security token industry. I'm not being arrogant here, but in doing our offering and coming up to our launch, my job is to learn everything I possibly can about this industry, talk to as many sources, right? That's what I do. I'm a research analyst. I have to get the story absolutely perfect before I explain it to everybody and tell everybody because I want to go over the risks and rewards, what I'm not seeing and just being in it, it's incredible because you're combining Wall Street with crypto. And you have people who are brilliant on both sides, but you don't have a lot of people who are brilliant and could bring these markets together. So it's not too easy to find people that know exactly what they're doing when it comes to both of these sectors. It's almost like finding uh, you know, a great stock analyst that's a good writer. <laughs> you know, it's almost impossible to do in this industry for some reason. Uh, but you know, things like that are, are rare. So going through this process and speaking to the younger kids who really didn't mean to, you know, launching their token, they, they, they're brilliant when it comes to the technology. They're brilliant when they say, hey, this is my big idea, but they don't know how to run companies. They don't understand the legal aspects of it. They didn't understand that, hey, if I open up in the U.S., these utility tokens are considered like a gift. So if someone gave you a Mercedes worth $100,000 right now, you have to pay tax. That's income. You have to pay taxes on it. It, it, it you know, if it appreciates, you got to, you got, it's capital gains if you sell it. But that's a utility token. So imagine you're giving $100,000 to, you know, you're getting into a utility token, you $100,000 to the company, and they had to pay $40,000 in tax that they didn't tell you about. Would you invest in that? I wouldn't invest in anything, any private placement if I had a, if I invested, you know, 100,000, whatever amount, 10,000, and I knew 40% of that was going to go to the IRS, I wouldn't invest in it. They didn't tell anybody this. They weren't required to tell anybody this. Again, their only requirement was to give you a token. So if you're wondering why this industry crashes, there it is. But for us, you know, partnering with Securitize, with, you know, using the best lawyers, uh, in this industry, people, we welcome more regulation. We want to see more regulation. You know, I said earlier, you, you want to be safe in this industry. You need to know that your money is protected. Uh, you need to have confidence in this industry. And once you do, you're going to see tons of people, and especially the institutions, rush in as long as there's a legal structure. And that's what the SEC is working on right now, meeting with the right people, trying to incorporate this pretty much in the 1930 to 34 document with the SEC on security regulations. That's what they're working on right now because they know digital assets are here. It is the future. It's here to stay. And that's a process that we're going through. And we're going to see a ton of news over the next 9, 12 months. Again, I said a lot of exchanges are going to be launched. T0 is coming out first um, in the next couple of months. And through Token Tracker, you're going to see a lot of this industry news and a lot of stuff. Now, before I share the details of the actual offering that we're doing to Curzio Equity Owners, I, I wanted to just go over the growth plans really quick or where – I want Curzio Research to be next year, three years, 10 years from now, because I'm not too sure if a lot of people know this, and I explain this just briefly, that the financial newsletter publishing industry is an amazing business. I mean, one of the most scalable, high margin businesses in the world, where our average unit cost of production is highest with one subscriber and falls with every additional subscriber. So for example, and I'm gonna give you accurate numbers, Curzio Research has roughly 7,000 paid subscribers, right? We're gonna disclose all this stuff when we come out with our white paper and, and securities agreement. Uh, and that's of, you know, as of last month. So if 100,000 people subscribe to our newsletters tomorrow, you know, our cost of production is gonna be minimal since our newsletters are sent electronically. Hey, no printing, postage, you know, pay a little bit more money for email to email people and, and stuff like that. And, you know, nothing crazy, uh, maybe a few customer service reps, but, that's the way the business works. I mean, unlike data mining, right, for crypto, where you can only generate a certain amount of money through the machines you're using and the place you're operating in terms of electricity costs. So if you want to generate more money, you have to spend more money. You have to buy more computers. 
Uh, you have to buy more electricity, which is expensive, and most of the cheaper areas have already been contracted, right? Whatever it is, it's probably under seven cents per kilowatt now. Uh, if you get that, you do it all day, but it's a lot higher, right? I mean, it's, you know, I visited one of the facilities, it's extremely hot. You need to, it's better to operate in a cold area, keeps your costs down. But if you're looking at an industry like that, you really need Bitcoin to move higher to actually make more money, right? So, you know, if you're looking at, you have to buy more computers, you have to buy more electricity, but every time you figure out a block, actually, the next one gets harder, which means you actually will generate less money over time if the price of crypto stays the same. So with our business, it's not like that. I mean, you could generate 100,000 subscribers just a matter of sending out more emails, so it's easily scalable, which is important because it blends into our growth strategy where – we explained uh, you know, numerous times and just through the amount of revenue that we generated, which is close to $7 million on our first two years of business, that we achieved proof of concept and new subscriber acquisition. Our numbers are incredible. Uh, some things work and some things don't. We think we're going to be king of the STL market. We think we have a lot of really good things I'm not going to mention here uh, of what we plan to do. But through our crypto intelligence newsletter, which – is going to be really cool because anybody that comes into offering and is a credit investor is going to get a free subscription to all of our products over a certain time period. Uh, you're going to have access to a lot of the STOs that we're seeing because during this process, companies have been contacting me because they're, they love it. They're starting to understand it, but they're like, all right, who do you use? Who do you do this? And now we have lawyers and we have securitize and just uh, you know, the people that I've met behind the scenes and travel to San Francisco and stuff like that. Uh, you have a network that will be coming like the main hub here of information where we have so many contacts of people are coming to us through the podcast and interviewing people. They want to launch these security tokens. They're waiting for me. We're first to the party <laughs> and they're waiting to see if I fall on my face, which I don't think we're going to do. I'm just saying that because in terms of uncertainty, regulation and things like that, but the fact that we're doing everything by the book uh, is, is really awesome and using the best people. Uh, it's going to be really cool. So, uh, that's going to give you access to a lot of ideas early. Security tokens offerings early, which offer discounts in their pre-sale, private sales, or whatever. So we're going to have access to a lot of these ideas. Two that I know want to come out with security tokens who I've spoken to that have fantastic businesses. So having this kind of access is going to be amazing in this industry, and that's going to be you know one of our big growth initiatives. Also, to make sure that we're marketing the right packages, right? I mean, when we mark market packages... I mean, if we look at our competitors and, you know, we've all been part of these, you know, bigger places that we work for, uh, you know, it's a huge idea comes out every two weeks, right? And for us, we kind of want to be like Take-Two. So Take-Two is great. I love Take-Two. It's one of my favorite companies. Now, if you look at, at the industry in terms of video games, you have, you know, Electronic Arts, Activision, uh, you know, Tencent, you know, that they're big, you know, overseas. But say Call of Duty. Right, so you're looking at a Call of Duty where Activision rolls out a new Call of Duty game every single year. You know, not because they have a great idea, a great concept to make the game better. It's basically the same game with a little bit of tweaks every year, but it's because this way they could generate that recurring revenue stream. Right, that's cool for the company, but as a user, you know, listen, if it's a sports game like Madden or 2K, it's different because you always have different teams that are going to be great. You have different players entering the league. There's always new information. There's always new content. With this, it's kind of like, uh, eh, you know, a couple new boards or whatever, and it does well. What Take-Two does is different. And just you know, before we get to Take-Two, it's kind of like the Apple strategy. And Apple used to sell an iPhone every two years and every 18 months, then every year. Now it's three phones, you know, they're shoving down your throat and trying to raise prices on these things, even though there's no new innovations or features. There's not. There's nothing that as a necessity that I need. And, you know, you wonder why they're not selling as many phones because they're so expensive. And, you know, not to mention that the latest version isn't really that great. You know, my wife has it, but it's hard to continue to innovate every year to come out with something great. But what, what Take Two does is they come out with Grand Theft Auto like every six I – mean, last time I think it was like 2013. And once this thing is released, it be, it's the highest grossing entertainment product in the history of the world. Bigger than any movie, song, book, you know, all entertainment products. And they have like 2,000 developers. They have everybody working on it to make it perfect where this game has longevity, where you're playing it and – 
you know, you, they're still generating a fortune off it today. You know, it was launched in 2013. So, I mean, they broke records, world records in terms of, you know, day one sales, day, you know, first week in sales, monthly sales. I mean, every time period up to a year, basically. And it's still generating a fortune. So it generated, I believe, $800 million its first day and over a billion dollars in its first three days that they launched, you know, the Grand Theft Auto V. And they're coming out with a new one probably in about two years. So they also did the same thing with Red Dead Redemption. You've probably seen commercials for it. I mean, they, again, another 2,000 developers worked on this. Uh, for seven years, they launched this. It's an amazing game that you could play forever, but it's a concept. It's secular. It's something that you're going to continue to, 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 to build out, you know, go online and stuff. And you create this loyal following of people instead of just forcing and say, hey, I have a great idea this week. I have another great idea. It's going to go up 20,000. So and forcing that down your throat with us, we want to take a step back and, and Market the ideas we truly believe are going to make you a fortune, like STOs. There's other ideas that I believe that that are crucial right now. You know, big idea, but you're not going to come up with a big idea every two weeks. You're probably not going to come up with a big idea every six months. But when we do, we want to be able to market it and be confident behind our marketing and not just sell some piece of shit to you because you know marijuana is hot and, and crypto is hot at the right time. You know, I think that's important because you build a loyal following when it comes to your subscribers, where they trust you. When they trust you, they tell everybody about you. They follow you forever, and that's why I've been in this business for 25 years. It's been very honest, very upfront with people, and, and you know, sometimes that results in people getting ticked off. But hey, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. So having that model, I think, makes a lot more sense. Where you're not just sending out things to make your numbers all the time and, and go crazy and stuff like that. We understand that, especially in our business, you know, you have to take a step back. You know, or basically to, to go forward, because once you have subscribers and, you know, they're subscribing to your product, there's only so much that they're going to subscribe to. So you have to spend money to build that list even further, which means you have to take a step back, which means, you know, a lot of companies, at least that I see, don't want to take that step back. They're like, don't pedal to the metal. We're going to send you promotions. We're going to send you stuff every single day, every single day. What we do is we send out promotions when we're promoting stuff. You know, which is like a two to three week period. And we do it probably on once a month basis. And sometimes we'll send out other deals and things like that. But it's not in your face three, four times a day, continuously getting those emails, which, you know, once you're on those lists, it's almost impossible to get off, which is interesting. But that's not what we're trying to do here. So looking at our growth model and spending to, to for our list where when people see our platform and get onto it and listen to the podcast and we offer more free content than anyone. And why do we do that is because we're confident in our research. Because like the Dollar Shave Club, you're selling it for a dollar. Yeah, that's cool. How do you make money off it? Well, they have a really good product. So people who say, okay, let me try it for a dollar, try the product, say, wow, this is really good, and they pay $9.95 a month for it. If you have a crappy product to sell, then you can't sell originally for a dollar because people are just going to pay a dollar. They're going to see it's crappy, and, and then they're going to disappear. So that's why you have newsletters being sold for $79, 129 This way at least they're generating revenue off of it. So there's a lot of things to this model that doesn't make sense the current model that I see in the industry to the point where it's so overhyped and so crazy. And some of these editors, I mean, don't even care. They don't, really don't even care, you know, what's going on or whatever, you know, they're making fortunes. They don't care. They're not investing in any of the crap that they gave you. But when you see a lot of this, it's just, uh, it's resulting in a big change in the industry and it's happening right now. And it's a reason why there's a lot of people knocking on our door to work here, like great copywriters, great marketers, you know, so raising this money, we're going to be able to build a much bigger team and, and do it the right way and be more about the customers and more about the people. Again, I'm not trying to be righteous here. I'm not, you know, I'm just not bullshitting you. This is personal to me. And the fact that this used to be an industry people turn to to get away from Wall Street to hear the real story, it's now worse than Wall Street. It really is in terms of how they treat their customers. And it's terrible. So there needs to be a change. And if we're able to disrupt it, uh, that's great. It's going to be better for all of you and everyone in the industry. But that's what we're trying to do. We're going to spend more money on marketing, more money on acquisitions, more money on building uh, our team and working on b having very, very big promotional things when we believe things are going to make you money. That's what we feel confident about promoting and telling you, hey, we really believe this could go up five times, ten times over the next five, ten years. This is why. Here it is. Here's our research. Here's us in the field, which we do. You're going to see us in the field with management teams, videos uh, uh, of you know, the actual, you know, just interviewing the CEO, going to the employees, visiting sites. I mean, that's what research is supposed to be, right? Not sitting behind a desk and saying, okay, yeah, this looks good. Let's sell marijuana. Everybody's going to buy it. Let's do a promotion. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it.
So this is the reason why we're doing this. A lot of things ahead, a lot of growth plans to, to about to launch this thing. And before I go, I wanted to give you a few details since we're going to launch in a couple of weeks. So again, it's going to be called Curzio Equity Owners. Symbol's going to be CEO. We're looking to raise $12 million. It's only going to be available to accredited investors. Our minimum is going to be $25,000, which is average for average minimum for most private placements, at least a lot of the ones that I share with my Curzio Venture Opportunity subscribers. I understand that not everyone's going to be able to invest in this, but after it goes trading after a year, you will be. But under regulation, and we're doing a Reg D filing, that we have to do it to credit investors only, and it has to be a lockup period of 12 months where the token's not going to trade until 12 months later, which is great because we're going to see so much development over this industry in that time frame. That's what we're anticipating. That's what we're hearing. So many more exchanges we can negotiate to get the token on their exchanges. We also have guaranteed liquidity if we want to use something called Bancor. Uh, through Securitize, so you're going to be liquid and be able to trade that. That's an option for us. I'd rather go on exchanges, which we're going to be negotiating if this thing is successful, if we meet our minimum, which is going to be $3 million. The very first week that we sell this is only going to be available to you. The podcast listeners are subscribers. Only to you. We're going to raise up to $4 million in that pre-sale in the first week. It's going to be a $25,000 minimum, but guys, you could do the math on that. I and mean, we're looking for less than 500 investors if everyone comes in at the minimum. But this isn't like a newsletter where you, know, you sell thousands of dollars subscriptions. It, it's an amount. So after the first couple of weeks, if somebody says, hey, you know what? You have $5 million left on the offering. I want to take the whole thing. It's done. It's over. That's it. Okay, for that offering. So, you know, we have a cap at 12 million. Once you reach it, that's it. It could be one investor. Well, it's probably not going to be one investor. It could be 10 investors. It could be whatever, 480. But there is a limit. And we're in that first week, we're going to offer a 10% discount where you can get a 10% discount off the offering uh, or additional 10% worth of tokens just for you. And that's going to be, you know, that private sale. Again, we're not taking on any institutions right now. We're not doing anything. This is about you. That's why I'm doing this business. So if people want to invest in it, that's your chance. And again, not all of you are credit investors, I understand, uh, but this is going to be trading 12 months from now if everything is successful with the launch and you'll be able to invest in it. We're also going to be paying a dividend. I can't say we're going to pay a guaranteed dividend because you know we're not allowed, but we plan on paying a quarterly dividend through the first year of 3% and the next two years after that, 3% annually. So um, and it's going to be paid on a quarterly basis in cash. You're not going to find a better crypto deal than that. And not only that, which is the kicker for all of you, is investors who do come in for that 25000 are going to get all of our newsletters and everything we produce in the future. And if it's a $25,000, you are going to get two years for free. At $50,000, it's going to be five years. And if you come in at $100,000 uh, or more, it, you get a lifetime free to everything, no maintenance fees, no nothing. Okay, so, you know, which I think is an unbelievable deal. Considering just for that package, our competitors charge anywhere from – 20,000 to 40,000 to become one of those platinum chairman club alliance. What else do they call it? You know, we have all the memberships and they also charge your fee for that. We're not going to charge you a fee for the, for investors coming into this. So as an accredited investor, what does that mean? You're going to have access to a Curzio venture opportunities, which also offers private placements. You're going to have access to crypto intelligence, which we're going to be one of the top in this industry, which we plan to be in terms of being connected to the right people and the right offerings, which we're going to get a, you know, a great look at as these things come out. And the fact that we're going to have a large following, it's going to give us access to a lot, a lot of deals, which is fantastic. And a lot of you know, chances and opportunities for you guys to invest in security token offerings. Again, if you're not a credit investor, we're still going to invest in security tokens, which a lot of them are going to start launching probably after Q1, Q2, Q3. Uh, a lot of this stuff that we'll be able to invest in and a lot of stuff you'll probably see on sites like Coinbase and T zero. So those are the details right now. Again, it's going to go out to you guys for the first week before we launch the masses where the first 4 million we're looking to raise is just going to be from you guys. Um, there is going to be a 10% discount. If you have a lifetime offer to any of our products, we could offer an additional discount because I understand that's the right thing to do, but uh, we're looking forward to this launch. I'm working my ass off to get this thing done. I'm excited. We're very, very close and, and you know, just expect to see a lot of information over the next few weeks. So, that's why I think 2019 is going to be a really cool year. Hopefully you'll join me with this. I'm very excited. If not, I understand it's perfectly cool, but it's not often that you get a chance to disrupt an industry or do something unique like this that, that is really cool. 
and you know, so many of my friends in the industry, hundreds of people that I explain this to are really excited. You know, it's funny, even though they're competitors, like, wow, holy cow, this is pretty cool. And I've never seen anything like this. And you don't get a chance in your life to do something like this. And I'm pretty excited. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really cool. So expect to see more information going forward. Next week's Wall Street Unplugged, back to normal. We do more, you know, interviews and try to get some guys on the security token industry and things like that. I've been talking to to educate you more because I want you to get educated on this industry. I don't care if you invest in my company. I don't care if you invest in my STO. Over my life, I've been able to get into trends early just by getting out there, going to Consumer Electronics Show next week, uh, you know, probably a mining conference two weeks later in the middle of this whole launch. You know, I, I, just for me, I love to travel. I love to find new ideas and, and we're able to do that with our network. This is something that I think is going to be bigger than anything I've ever researched. Okay, so even if you don't invest in my company, even if you're like, oh, first time listening to this podcast, Frank's an idiot, I hate his voice, whatever, start learning about this industry. You could do so by going to the Token Tracker website. You could do so by going to Tokenist. Hacker Noon, whatever. Uh, there's some, a lot of good sites out there, but you're going to see the development that's taking place in this industry behind the scenes, which nobody's talking about, which means you can get into this industry very, very early in its infancy, and that's how you create fortunes. Not by investing in Netflix when it's $250 and it goes to $400. No. You want to be like the venture capitalist that invests in Netflix or, or Facebook when it's $3, $5, $10, and then they come public. That's the opportunity you're going to get in this industry where you're investing in early stage companies very, very early on, and if things are successful, they can make an absolute fortune. That's how you invest when it comes to risk reward. You want to make sure you're putting up a little to make a ton. And this industry gives you that opportunity. So you'll learn a lot more in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully I didn't bore you, right? I don't know if I could talk the whole time and keep everyone entertained the entire time, right? Without having a guest. Usually it's broken up a little bit and stuff like that. So um, but either way, if you guys want more information on this, uh, if you're a credit investor, uh, you know, just again, no obligation. But if you want more information, email me, frankcursorresearch.com. It's frankcursorresearch.com because it's going to launch in a couple of weeks and I'll be sure to send you every single detail. Okay, guys. Any comments, questions as well? Always, I'm here for you. You can also use frankcursorresearch.com. Send me an email. But guys, thanks so much for listening. Happy New Year. Looking forward to 2019. And I'll see you in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decision solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.